So we need to ask God for balance. So that we, we don't do more than we can. And that we are not taking more than we should. And just because we can doesn't mean we should. Do you understand? A lot of people, a lot of people can do things, but should you? And when we walk with God, he gives us that balance so that we don't get out of order. Someone say amen. All right. So again, the prayer and the balance is what I want you to, to kind of think about this week. And the scripture we gave you about sowing sparingly, reaping sparingly, and stop thinking just money. Amen. Stop thinking just money. Could be a kind word. Could be, you know, son, I love you, or, you know, gosh, it's good to see you. You know, that, that sowing and reaping. So good morning, church. This is the day the Lord hath made, and we will what? Rejoice and be glad in it. So our lesson for today is the steps of a righteous man. The steps of the righteous man. God really wants us to have our steps ordered. He wants to lay them out so that we have security. And wherever we walk, can you say amen? And though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil because you are with me. Amen. All right. So God wants us not to be ignorant concerning any of the wonderful gifts and the kingdom that he's given us. There's one of those provisions that he's made is he given us a system where he can guide us. Amen. Where we can follow God with a general and specific guidance system. The Bible tells us in Isaiah 11 that there are seven spirits of God. Really, the, there's only one spirit of God, but has seven attributes. And you can use a little candle, the menorah candle, which the, has the six branches and the one in the center. The one in the center is Jesus, is pounded out of one piece of gold, showing divineness. But all of the different lights are a part of the Holy Spirit, his wisdom, his knowledge, the fear of the Lord. You know, all of these things. If you get a chance, read Isaiah 11, 1 through 3 talks about Jesus. But you'll notice the menorah candle, all of the lights are facing towards the center and the center is Jesus. Amen. So one of the things that we're going to be sharing with you is that in the Old Testament, people only had types and shadows and little pictures of how God is, what will God do. They are full of fear. They have no relationship with God on the inside of us. We're going to look at all this different stuff and kind of give you some things that you can pass on to others. Can you say amen? All right. So one of these provisions is God has given us a way to be, to follow him, especially to follow him specifically. Amen. Certain things, you know, maybe you know that you should lay hands on the sick, but when and how might be the specific area that God needs to show to you. I remember one time praying for somebody. His uh, girlfriend at the time, they were engaged, but it never, they never ended up getting married. But they were very close. He was a good friend of mine. He brought his girlfriend, and we went out to eat and everything like that. And we came back, and she was suffering from, she, she didn't tell us she can't eat celery. And so we went out to Chinese food. And what did she order? Celery. You know, in, you know, I don't know the different dishes or whatever that, chow mein or whatever that kind of stuff. And, and it was reacting to her. And so she asked me, she said, they came back to the house and they're sitting on a couch and I'm sitting on the couch. And, and she asked me, she says, well, can you pray for me, man? Because I don't feel good at all. You know, we just had a great time and we went on. I says, sure. And the Lord says, wait. So I'm sitting there waiting on God and she's looking pretty gray. <laughs> and she says, are you going to pray for me or not? I said, I'm just waiting for God's go. See, God has timing. And see, for us, if we're wondering about it, it's going to mess that up. So God just said, wait. And then all of a sudden, I don't know how many minutes, four or five minutes, he says, now it's time. And so I got up, I says, time. So she got up off the couch, and remember, 
my good friend sitting right on the couch there, and my wife was sitting over there. So I get up, and she gets up, I grab hold of her hands, and suddenly the room disappears, she disappears, and all I can see is her skeleton, and two little demons hanging off her kidneys. Now this is called discerning a spirit. Now I didn't purpose that. I don't have some special gift, but really, here's what happens. God gives you what you need to get the job done if you will trust him. So when I grabbed hold of her, it's just like a, the house disappeared, everything disappeared. I could see her skeleton, I could see these two demons, and I looked at them, and they seen that I saw them. See, the devil doesn't want to be exposed. Not at all. Okay. That's why it's so important for us to meet with God so we stay ahead of the workings of the enemy. We stay ahead of the problems that could be in our family. That we stay ahead of the situations that are coming. That God can show us what to do and how to do it. So I prayed for her. I says, I can see you. And they said, well, yeah, we don't want to leave. We don't want to leave. And they talked as if they were twins. I'm seeing all this. And I'm going, oh, yeah, you will. I bind you in the name of Jesus. I command you to drop off and to get out of my house and stay away from her and don't ever return. And they fell to the floor and backed out of my house, just like a couple little chipmunks. Ugly looking things, though. And you might say, well, how does that apply? What, it applies this way. If we seek God every day and ask him to guide our steps, you don't know when the adventures are going to pop out. But they're going to be exciting because they're going to be specific instructions on maybe timing, when, how. Jesus didn't always heal everybody the same way, did he? One time he spit and made clay. Another time he says, go wash. Hello? We want to follow the leading of the Spirit. So we really have some great equipment if we are taught and we learn how to utilize it. Someone say amen. So God wants us specifically instructed as well as generally understanding God's purpose and plan for our life. So the word is given to us for our admonition and instruction. All scripture is given by inspiration of God, Old Testament and New Testament. Amen. So what I want to give to you is the word of God is the general instructions and the general will of God. In order to get specifics from the general will of God, you have to have the Holy Spirit pointing and bringing these specifics out to you because not every one of you are an eye. Not every one of you are a foot. Not every one of you are an ear. You need specific instructions and not just general instructions. Sure, the word of God says thou shall not do these things. So in the general word of God, we've got all kinds of admonitions and learning. We can see what the Israelites did that was good. And we can see what the Israelites did when it wasn't so good. We can see the doubts of men. We can see the faith of men, the promises of Abraham. But we must remember when we're consulting the Old Testament that it's the first covenant and it has flaws. Oh no, it was written perfectly and the law is glorious and perfect. But the flaw it had is it couldn't relieve man of their sin. It could only cover their sin like somebody paying your dinner debt every year. And then when the years bowed up, there was a reminder how sinful the nation is. The priest has to go in, sacrifice for himself, his family. And if he lives, then for the nation. You see how difficult all that was? But yet we can look at that Old Testament realizing that they did not know God intimately. They only knew God through what was prophesied through the prophets and the priests and the kings. So they knew God not as an intimate loving father. But they only knew God as general God. You better not mess up. 
or the earth will open up and swallow you. Now, could you imagine a person in the New Testament, all they're doing is reading the Old Testament per year? How they could get the wrong picture of their father. I know, well, what if I do something and it's in impossible for God to restore me. First of all, that's Old Testament. It's relating to the Jews which were twice dead, dead to the law and dead to the promises of Abraham. And it's as if they turn away from Jesus, it's almost impossible for them to re repent because they have to jump through so many hoops because they were given the ordinances of God, they were given the promises, the covenants, they were given the threats, they've seen the blessings, they've seen the cursings. But we're not like that. Folks, I'm not a Jew, although I bless them. I'm a Gentile. I'm Scottish. I'm a Scottish Gentile. I don't want to be a Jew. I want to be a Scottish Gentile who loves Jesus. You see, it seems like our society is always wanting to be something they're not. And the only way we can do that is through Jesus Christ. Can you say, oh me? So the word that God gives us is a general description of what, what to do and what not to do. For example, the Ten Commandments. Yet God has provided a personal guide for you and I. Because we're not in the Old Testament, we're in the New Testament. Jesus said, I will not leave you comfortless, yet I will come to you. A little while I'll be gone, but then I'm going to come to you. I will send you another comforter. And he will guide you. He will teach you. He will show you things to come. He will judge the devil and his sentence is upon him. He will judge the earth because they have rejected Christ. And he will judge men's hearts for righteousness. For the only way that you and I become righteous is by accepting the righteous one, Jesus Christ, in our heart. For he who knew no sin, Jesus, was made to be sin for us. So that you and I become the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. So God doesn't look at you as a sinner. He looks at you as one of his children. And he's working hard to get you to get into steps so he can bless you and lift you out of the miry clay. Can you say amen? And he'll put your foot on a rock to stay. He'll fill your heart with praise today. Amen. That's who you are. Go with me to Luke chapter 6, please. 46 to 48. The Holy Spirit was given to us to give us specifics. So in the, in the Bible, we have generalities. Old Testament and New Testament. Are you with me? All right, in Luke chapter 6, 46 to 48. But why do you call me Lord, Lord? Now remember, he is not risen from the dead yet. So he's still in the Old Testament. So he's talking to everybody, his disciples and the Jewish listeners that are there. And the people are just coming around, you know, kind of hanging around Jesus because he's an exciting thing. Do you know people follow different trends and waves of things? That's why Christians, we don't follow waves. We're in the God, can you say amen? I'm not looking for a revival as a wave. I'm looking for change in our hearts. Hello. Because when we change in our hearts, revival breaks out in our lives. Amen. So that's why we meet with God and then we have God give us an evaluation. Lord, how am I doing? Crickets. Crickets. I wish we had that little cricket thing you have on your phone. Click, 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 click. How am I doing? I got click, 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 cricket. You know, click, 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 click. Amen. Well, you're doing good because you're walking with God, right? So how could you not be doing good? This. Keep this in check. Your mind. Keep it in check because it will wander. Now, put a leash on it. 
It's called the Word of God, the anchor of the soul. All right, so right, here we go. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do the things which I say? Don't tell me I'm your Lord if you can't even do what I'm asking you. That's what he's saying. Whoever comes to me, first you got to come to him. Come to me, all you that labor and heavy burden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. Learn from me. I'm meek. I'm lowly. And you will find rest to your souls. For my yoke is easy. My burden is light. Amen. And he says, whoever comes to me and hears my sayings and does them, I will show you to whom he is like. He is like a man building a house who dug deep. Here's the problem. Christians aren't in their word like they should. They're not digging out truths that they need for their personal life. They're just reading the Bible or reading a, a, a promise. I'm not putting anybody down. I'm just telling you. you and, and the enemy's backing off of those people, letting them know oh, you're doing just fine. You see, the enemy will back off of certain people, letting them think, because he watches and monitors their sloppy disciplines. Now, see, I'm not a legalistic person. I'm not a person that says, you better be doing this. No, there's certain things that you and I have to do to maintain some sanity. Can you say amen? amen. We have to pray. It just says when you pray. It doesn't say if you pray. We have to fast once in a while. If you don't know about it, come see me. I'll teach you all about fasting. Okay? There's a right way to fast. There's a wrong way to fast. Okay, but there are different things you see and the enemy just wants us ignorant he wants us trying to sort things out on our own yet we can consult the world, word of God and we can see the word of God gives us a general idea of what to allow and what not to allow but when it comes time to our husband or our wife or our children or our job these specifics we need specific instructions the how to's the why's have to be given by God. Say amen. And he says, for he who hears my saying and does them, I'll show you who he's like. He is like a man building his house dug deep and laid the foundation on the rock. Who's the rock? Jesus. Jesus. Amen. You, you digging deep? Are you laying on the rock? Are you, or, or are you building on your talents only? <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> All right. Then he goes on. And when the flood arose and the stream beat behemoth, that's just the world, against that house, it could not shake it because it was founded on the rock. Jesus has never been moved. He's never lost a fight. He's not even considered the devil. When the devil confronted Jesus, he says, if you be the son of God, well, first of all, Jesus created the devil, but he didn't create him as a devil. He created him as a helping angel. Satan is the author of sin and evil. And when he created the devil, when the devil says, if you be the son of God, what a jerk. Command these stones be made bread. You fasted 40 days. You should be pretty hungry by now. I'm putting all that in, okay? You get it? I mean, I'm adding a little bit to it. And Jesus said what? Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. So we have an Old Testament. We have a New Testament. These are all the word that proceed out of the mouth of God. So generally, we can consult it. When we're in the Old Testament, we can consult the do's and the don'ts of the other people so that we can avoid the problems that they fell into. We can consult the New Testament when Jesus spoke to his disciples. Judge not. Don't consider the speck. You know, die to yourself. If you want to follow me, take up your cross and follow me. And he laid out certain truths and certain insight so that they could follow. And the Holy Spirit now, in the New Testament, is going to give us specifics. For example, what God says to Denise is going to be different, generally the same, according to the word, but specifically different when it comes time with her life. She needs to know. God might require her to pray an hour a day. 
But if she doesn't consult God, she will never know. So she'll just continue on trying her heart on things. You're not a trier of the word. You're a doer of the word. Can you say amen? So I gave you a couple of scriptures for you to kind of look at. All right. But I want to, before we get to these scriptures, to show you that in the Old Testament, there are people right now who are practicing Old Testament principles in the New Testament. They sort of put Christ aside, picked up flags, and they are trying to be Jewish. And folks, if you read two-thirds of the Bible, Paul deals with it in Galatians and Colossians and Ephesians, those people that try to get everybody to live the Old Testament in the New Testament. You cannot live the Old Testament in the New Testament. What I mean by that is you cannot practice what didn't work in the Old Testament and expect it to work in the New Testament. You need to have the God juice. You need to have God inside us. Can you say amen? So he inspires our steps. So that he leads us by the Spirit. And we're not just generally trying out things like so many Christians today. I mean, they're Christians today. They're just trying out, the, and they're getting beat up. It's kind of like Satan's reading the plan that they got. You know, if you've been a coach at a football team, the last thing you want is your adversary to know what your plays are. That's why we were given the Holy Spirit, so that the Holy Spirit could teach us from the Word things Satan can't hear. To teach us from the word what Satan can't hear. Satan knows the word, but he doesn't have any revelation of it. Because the revelation, listen to me, the revelation of the word deals with the future. And Satan can't go into the future. So he monitors you on when you're reading the word on how you're going to respond, whether you're going to be in the flesh or you're going to be in the spirit. If you're in the spirit, immediately it's hands off. Satan has lost you. He's got to tempt you. He's got to call you back out of the Lord, back into yourself so he can mess with you. But thank God you're faithful to meet with God every day and get that taken care of so you're not listening to the voice of strangers. Are you with me? Okay. Here's my second point. Isaiah 55 says God's word comes down just like snow and, and rain and waters the earth. So it brings forth the bud. It brings forth the growth. So shall my word that go out of my mouth. It shall not return unto me void, but shall accomplish in the thing whereunto I have sent it. Amen. And you are that thing where God sends his word. He says, the kingdom of God is like unto a man casting seed into the ground. Those by the wayside hear it, receive it with joy, but have no root. And he, so God's building a kingdom in us, depending on how good our listener is. Are you with me? He with ears, let them hear. He with a mind, please keep it quiet so you, you can listen. Amen. And then thirdly, we get into the word for God to speak to us and show us who he is, how he operates. So generally, we can look at that. We can see it through the word of God. The word was made flesh and it dwelled among them. In the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. So the word still is God. So guess what? When you get in the word, you're consulting God and the Holy Spirit, who is God, will begin to show you what God wants to happen in your life. He will show you things to come. Glorious. It's glorious. The problem is we're too distracted. My goodness. All right. Go with me to Luke chapter 8, please. Look at verse 18. Have you ever noticed that you have one mouth and two ears? That's the ratio. Listen twice as much as you do talking. Now, talking is okay. For example, if I got up here and started talking in some language you didn't understand, well, what good would it be for you? 
And if I got up here and started using big words that you didn't understand, what good would it be for you? So communication and speaking the word is really important about being clear. The straight of truth between two points is the pure truth. Can you say amen? And remember what Paul said? He says, if you're going to speak the truth, speak it in love. The more truth you have to tell somebody, look, you did this. I don't care what you're denying. I know you did it. You're the only one that could. But I'm telling you because I love you. Now, please don't continue to do that. See, that's speaking the truth in love. Because your intent is to get somebody to change. Can you say amen? All right, let's move on. Luke 18. Or excuse me, 8, 18. Therefore... It says, if you have a light, don't stick it under a bush or a bed, okay? But put it on a lampstand. It says, therefore, I quoted the part there, therefore, because of, you don't want to hide your light, therefore, take heed how you hear. See, when I come to church, I'm all ears. I'm not all mouth. Ecclesiastes 5, 1 through 3. It says, therefore, take heed how you hear, and for whatever, for whoever has. Everyone say, have. What do you have? The ability to listen. Man, that front pew should be covered. Everybody should be like this. Not because it's me, because it's the word of God. If you were in a seminar, I remember sitting under a world convention under Kenneth Copeland Ministries, and we were having a world communion. And I got into the second row with a friend of mine. We were sitting there just drooling for the word of God, and it came forth. You see, when we're in the presence of God, the Holy Spirit monitors our hunger and how eager we are to learn. Then he just dumps it through the pastor or the, whoever's ministering the word of God, and it just comes right on out. But if you got a congregation that really could care less, they're just putting in their time at church, you know, and get their little bit done and everything like that, their mind's somewhere else. I'm not trying to put anything down. Just listen. The Holy Spirit waits. And the pastor's frustrated because he's like he's paying, paying racquetball. Everything he hits out to the audience is bouncing back. See, when my, people are not listening, they're not paying attention, the anointing who, give, who gives out the truth bounces back. You see, and you don't, don't realize that. And so when we come, everything else is put aside. God is made to know that he is first when you come to church. That you are coming to church early to meet with the king. You're not showing up late. Now, I'm not picking on people that come to church late, but think about it. If you are invited to, to somebody you really respect and to come and sit and listen to them, wouldn't you be early? I would be. Absolutely. Prepared and early. Prepared and early. So, people that sometimes allow things to get in the way of receiving the ability to hear are usually the ones Satan picks on to steal from. And here it is right in scripture. Look what this says. Now, I'm not picking on anybody because we people are get late. But if you're consistently late, there's something spiritually needs to be adjusted. Rather than coming under a condemnation, Go to God and tell him, please fix me. Please fix me. Can you say that, everybody? Jesus, please fix me. Do you think you're all fixed right now? Of course not. See, that's the real mellow part of it. We're not all fixed. So there I can look at you through the love of Jesus and know that God loves you as much as he loves me and that he's working on you. You're under construction and he's working on me. I'm under construction. So therefore, guess what? I'm going to do and say everything that I can to encourage you to fulfill the will of God for your life. And I expect you to do the same. Can you say amen? But if our actions say something different, something else is at work. So listen to the rest of this. It says... 
For whoever has, more will be given. And whoever does not have the ability to pay attention, to listen, even what he seems, see the word seems there, seems to have, will be taken from him. Now, God doesn't take anything from us, except for our sin, but we have to offer it up to him, see. Then he'll take it. If we never offer up or admit that we're sinners, God can't take it from us. Right? So we offer up every day. Lord, cleanse me, wash me, make sure there's nothing in the way. Amen. I want to be a ready writer in your hands. I want you to be able to speak through me, Lord. I don't want my words to touch the ground, but to accomplish the thing that you want them to in the ears of those that hear. Amen. See, what you don't know is when we start hearing the word, your countenance goes up. There's a light that starts flickering off you. It's called the Shekinah glory, but it's actually your countenance. When God confronted Cain in the beginning of Genesis chapter 4, he says, why has your countenance fallen? Sin lies at the door. Don't open it. Its job is to devour you, to, to cause you confusion, to cause you an alternative to not serve God, to feel like you're always a failure. But thank God you're not. Because you take heed and you listen. And if you're a good listener to the word, more will be given you. Well, pastor, I mean, I have enough. I'm pretty blessed. You talk that way. That's not good. God walks on what we value. Streets of gold. Do you know people have killed people for gold? He walks on it. He says nothing. God doesn't care how much money you have. He cares about how you use it. And for what reason you use it. That's all it is, is a means of exchange. It isn't your life. What is the profit of man if he gained the whole world and lose his own soul? I'd rather gain the Lord. Because when I gain the Lord, he's wise enough to automatically teach me how to prosper. It's just part of being with the king. What do you mean I'm late and I missed the instructions how to get the next meal? Now you got to run around with your Christianity and borrow it from everybody, read a book, catch up on something, and yet you could have been at the feet of Jesus. Someone say, or me. A couple of points. In the Old Testament, we believers, those believers were looking forward to the Christ's coming, the Messiah's coming. But they had only types and shadows of Christ. And I said that a little bit earlier, but I'm going to give you the scriptures here in just a minute. In the New Testament, we have Christ living on the inside of us. And when he comes living in this inside of us, he has the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit right into your spirit in seed form. Everyone say seed form. And it says, if the seed remaineth in you, you shall not sin. Because the seed remaineth in you. What seed? God. He comes in in seed form. Now listen, I got to explain this. You don't get a baby Jesus <laughs> or a baby God. You get a seed package with all of God in there and all of God's kingdom and all of God's provisions and equipment all resident on the inside of us. Everyone say, I have it. Yeah. Now if I could only understand it. You have it on the inside of you, but now you need to learn how to get it out of here into the eyes of your understanding so that you may walk it out in this life. Can you say amen? This is what our Christianity is. is a walk that glorifies God. I remember one time my parents, they used to brag on me all the time. God forbid... 
And my dad was always proud of me. My mom was always, I had some wonderful parents, okay? Now I'm saying this so you understand. And my dad would say things, oh yeah, my son's a really good guy and everything. And so one day he invites us over to see his boss. This is the big boy, you know. And I'm going over to see his boss, and, and my dad says to me, oh yeah, and he's got a son your age, and you guys can play and everything like that. So what do I do? The son that could never do anything wrong hitched a rock and hit his son in the head and had to take him to the doctor. And you say, why are you sharing that, Pastor Curry? Because sometimes we think things and we say things that are really not of the Spirit of God. And my dad was trying to tell everybody how good I'm doing. And here I crown his son with a rock. So here's the deal. Often happens to God. God's always bragging on you and I. Look at the first two chapters of Job. God bragged. Have you considered Job? There's none like him. He's a righteous man. Blah, 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 blah. And yet Job married somebody who was unsaved. His children were totally in rebellion. Job was in total fear. That thing which I greatly fear has come upon me. And yet God's bragging on him. God brags on you. But here's what happens a lot of times. While he's bragging on us, we end up lumping somebody with a rock. <laughs> At times. Now, please. It might, might not be that drastic, but sometimes we'll leap something or say something. But listen, God doesn't look at that because I don't stop becoming my father's son just because I lump the kid with a rock. No, I'm in trouble. You see, in relationship, God, uh, my father is my father and I'm his son. And when I lump the guy with the rock... I didn't stop being my father's son. I just got out of fellowship. <laughs> and so when we mess up, we get out of fellowship. That means our prayers are hindered. That means our steps are ceased. The grace of God stops for just a moment until we right ourselves with the one who cleanses us. Can you say amen? The Bible says that we walk in the light as Christ is in the light. The blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sin. The Amplified says, continually, all day long, cleanses us from lumping somebody with a rock. Hello. Amen. And so my dad comes out and he says, what did you do? I says, dad. You know, aren't you glad? God's not going to throw you away because you blew it. Also, too, Satan will bring up your past. Your would haves your could haves your should haves You tell them old things have passed away, and you remind them of his future. It's kind of hot. Amen. So let's pass on this, and let's, let's get a little further out. Let me show you exactly why it's such a bad thing for us to practice the Old Testament in the New Testament. Galatians 3 says we fall from grace. But let me, let me just show you what the Old Testament is. In Hebrews chapter 10 verse 1, just listen. It says, for the law having a shadow of the good things to come and not the very image, Christ, of the things can never with these same sacrifices yearly, which they offer continually year by year, make those who approach perfect. So the law couldn't save anybody. It just reminded them every year that they need God. And you know something? Can Christians forget there's a God? Can they forget the promises of God? Surely they can. It says, forget not all his benefits. We don't want to, though. Can you say amen? So we know that the Old Testament were types and shadows. We're patterns all about Jesus coming. Listen to this. Colossians 2 verse 16 says this. So let no one judge you in food, what you eat, or in drink, 
or in regarding a festival or a new moon or the Sabbaths. See, there's more than one Sabbath, you know. Which are a shadow. Now, is shadows real things? They're just reflections of a real thing. So all the people in the Old Testament, they're still practicing Old Testament things. They're saying, this is, I'm going to give you this illustration. Scott and I and my wife, and we'll, listen, we'll use Brian and Diana. We're all in a little van and we're coming into Puyallup. And we see the sign on the side of the road, uh, Puyallup. Population, 50,500 and some odd, blah, 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 you know. And we, I stopped the car. What are you stopping for? I go, Puyallup. So I ran over and I hugged the sign. Oh, Puyallup, Puyallup. You'd think I was nuts, wouldn't you? All the Old Testament people worshiping the law, worshiping all the ordinances and not God, are hugging Puyallup. What I'm saying is there's, they were hugging the shadows and the types and trying to get and glean from God. Hello. Now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face, then New Testament, we get to see God face to face. We see him in his word. We see him when we pray. Can you say amen? amen? See the difference? So all those people back then had to follow God by faith. They didn't get saved by sacrifices or being faithful or trying to keep the Ten Commandments. No, they were saved by faith. And when they tried to do the works in their own strength, God rejected them. It's not by the works of your own righteousness that saves you, but according to God's mercy, you have been saved. Amen. Hello? Are you still with me? So the shadows of things to come are not the real substance. So listen to the rest of this. So let no one judge you in the foods, the drinks, the Sabbaths, which are a shadow of things to come, but the substance is Jesus Christ. See, so even back in the Old Testament, those people got caught up in all kinds of, they loved God, or thought they did. But guess what? When Jesus showed up, what did they, what did they do to him? They crucified him. Because Jesus didn't match what they thought he should match. How often have we done that as a Christian? We think you should be doing this. How do you know? So, to fix that, we trust that every one of you will go to God and specifically get God's spirit and instruction on your day. And let God guide your steps and show you his way. Can you say amen? Well, that sounds pretty good, Pastor Kerry. We have God in us, correct? And we have God around us, correct? And then we have the Holy Spirit to guide us. So I'd like you to take your Bible and go with me to John 16. Look at verse 13 through 15. Jesus has just got through saying, I'm not going to leave you comfortless. I'm going to come to you. You're not going to be orphans. I'm going to come to you. I'm going to go, but then I'm going to come back via the Holy Spirit. So here's what he says. However, when he, the spirit of truth, when he's come, he will guide you into what? All truth. Everyone say all truth. All truth. Concerning God. All truth concerning God. See, all truth there is not everything. God is not going to reveal to you the worst things that Scott can do. <laughs> God showed me you're doing this wrong. God's not showing you that. That's a familiar spirit. God's not a tattletale. Well, I've seen prophets do that. Yeah, but they're under the wrong spirit. Because God does not embarrass you about your sin. You are his private child. Hey, neighborhood, let me tell you about my children's sin. And that's been rampant in the body of Christ for so long. 
No. Nobody wants to go to the prophets' meetings. <laughs> Hello. Those people are, are, are prophesying and giving out words that are negative and stuff. That's not of God. It's not of God. You can tell God when he speaks. He edifies, builds up. He comforts. And he exhorts. The exhorting is the hard part. He might say, Carrie, straighten up in this area and do this. And then I'll say, okay, Lord, and he comforts me. And then he builds me up for doing it. So everything God does has his fingerprint on it. Exhortation, comfort, and edification. If my sermon doesn't have that in there, then you can reject it. If somebody comes over to you with a heavy hand and says, Brian, I've got a word for you. It better line up with scripture. Amen. And it better line up with God, what he's already told you. You see, God's word from another person will only confirm God's personal word to you. So if God told you to do something and somebody else says the same thing, that's a confirmation. But say somebody else says something, move to Alaska and sell your dog. And you go, number one, I hate Alaska. It's too cold for me. And two, not that Alaska is a bad place. But, and I don't have a dog. <laughs> You understand? A lot of shenanigans going out there. And in the Northwest, we have whole groups of them. They don't belong to any one church, but they got a word for everybody. Stay away from that group. Hello? Unless you can say to that group, you need to sit under a pastor that's responsible and stay accountable so you don't damage God's property. Someone say, oh my. What's the Holy Spirit's job to do? To glide you and guide you into all truth. For he will not speak in his own authority. I, the Holy Spirit, say unto you. Never. That's flesh. Holy Spirit glorifies Jesus only. Listen, it says the very thing anyway. It says... Shall not speak on his own authority. Whatever he hears, he will speak. In other words, what he hears from God, he speaks to those that need to hear it. And he will tell you things to come. See, that's why you want to be personal with God. <clears throat> he will show you things to come. And if they are negative, what to do so they don't happen. Hello? Man, you should be excited. He will not, he will glorify me. He shall, he'll take what is mine and declare it unto you. The word declare means he's going to make a full picture of it to you. He's going to make it clear to you. This is what I want you to do. That's why we prayed for that situation. So that God can make it clear what we should do or not do concerning that situation. You see the specifics in that. Generality, the Bible says to confront, but when and how should be specifically given to you by the Spirit of God. Otherwise, you're going to take it and meddle with it. You know, a lot of Christians meddle. They invite themselves into straightening somebody else's life out. Do not do that unless it's your child. Don't invite yourself to straighten somebody out. Hello? You pray first. You'll find out if you can pray for a person that you can see needs really some work, and you pray for them, then God who loves them will start working on them. Did you know it was if it wasn't for somebody who must have saw me and had compassion on me and prayed for me, that's why I'm saved? Who knows? Probably driving down the freeway with a bong in my hand, a beer, you know, steering with my knee, you know, and somebody says, God save that man before he kills anybody. Hello? And guess what? Amen. God, one time I said to God, I says, I always talk to God like he's my best friend. Not to be disrespectful in any way. Sitting in a hot tub at Bally's, you know, the workout place. I don't even know if there's a Bally's anymore. So, I'm sitting in the hot tub and I said, look at all these people. They're like 
all the lonely people. Where do they all come from? You know, all the lonely people. And I said, Lord, I mean, my heart just goes, I can't witness to every one of them. He says, no, but you can pray for them. And he showed me just instantly. He says, claim that person right there. I already know their name. I already know their life. Bind up the enemy's assignment on them. Release their angels so they can be led into a place of hearing the gospel. And claim their salvation. And command the devil to leave them alone and don't return. And therefore, put them on my altar. If you do, I will work heaven and earth to save them. Because a covenant child has asked me to. Ask and you shall. Yeah. Amen. So he sat there and went 10, 15 minutes showed me how in a hot tub, how to claim a hundred people that came in and out of valleys. I'm thinking, oh yeah, how am I going to share that with the congregation? Well, I just did. When you look at something that's not right, take a minute out to pray. You don't like the situation, you don't know quite about it, and you're not release, take the time out to pray. Just a couple seconds. Hello. You feel something different. You're walking around and you, you just suddenly sense something weird. Am I coming down with something? No, take the time to pray. Amen. Amen. I wonder what it is I'm coming down with. Here, flag him. The devil walks up and he goes, oh, yeah, would you like the flu? Uh, would you like for this? How about that uh, migraine headache, you know? My, and he just comes out with a list. Says, what are you going to sign up for? I was waking in the morning with a knocking at the door. Yeah. So I got up and went to see what that knocking was for. Yeah. And there stood the devil with a box addressed to me. And he says, son, I got something here. I think you ought to see. Hello. Satan's always trying to give us another package, another alternative, another guesswork. Aren't you glad that you listen to God, you read your scripture, and you have the Holy Spirit dwelling in you and on and around you, guiding your steps, showing you and declaring to you what's next in your life? Something Satan can't gather. Satan doesn't hear the Holy Spirit telling you things. He's a dumb dumb. He's locked out of that future. And yet the Holy Spirit, if you look at everything it says there, talks about walking you into your future, revealing to you things to come, declaring unto you how it is. Some Satan cannot gather. He only reflects it off the big mouth people that can't keep their mouth shut. Well, how'd your prayer go? Oh, I hope God's going to answer it. Moving right along. You still love me? Don't throw anything. Amen. All right. So listen to this. He will guide me. He will glorify me. He will take what is mine and will declare it to you. Listen. 15. All things that the Father has are mine. Therefore I said that he, the Holy Spirit, will take of mine and declare it unto you. Hello. Couple points. Now that we're born again, we have God on the inside of us. He will always bear witness to the truth. So we have the Bible, which is God. We have God dwelling on the inside of us. It's called the inner witness. Everyone say inner witness. So when we're reading the word of God, if you take a little time in prayer and you're reading the word of God, certain scriptures will begin to pop out of there and you will witness to the truth. We're going to read the scripture here in a minute. But God will always bear witness to what is true concerning you. And if God isn't bearing witness, you might think timing's off. You might think it's not of God, even though it's in scripture. Hello. We know God wants us to prosper, but the timing of it has to be right. So that's why we get the specifics from the Holy Spirit. Are you still with me? Two. As we read the word, the Holy Spirit shows us by revelation what our needs are and how to lay hold upon those promises. Amen? God, if God shows you're lacking in an area, he's there to want to help you get it. He supplies all of your need, right? 
So if you're, if God asks you to go from point A to point B, and you're having a struggle with a mountain between point A and point B, what should you say to that mountain? Be thou removed, be thou planted in the sea. See, the mountain back then wasn't a real mountain, even though it includes a real mountain. It's talking about an obstacle between your journey. If you're journeying with God, which you all are, from point A to point B, and there's a mountain there, you have the authority to remove what any obstacle that's in the way of you growing and becoming who you are in Christ. So there is no donkey, no mountain, no tree, no problem that is able to keep you from the will of God because you can say, Father, I command that be removed in Jesus' name. Amen. Hello. I never saw a mountain as an obstacle. Well, you be on foot. Even if a donkey... Hello. Moving right along. Point three. The spirit of God will reveal and God in us will witness to the truth specific to our very need and how to apply it to get the results. Hello. Like the woman who needed deliverance. I had to wait for God's timing. When I did, God moved me in the realm of the Spirit. Are you with me? And fourthly, this is why we meet with God so we can get that instructions. That we can have a peace of mind. We don't wake up with stressful problems at work that we got to deal with. No, we go to God and get his wisdom. Can you say amen? And what we can't deal with at the time, we cast over on the Lord and God deals with it in his time. Yes. Can you say amen? It locks Satan right out of the whole situation. Right out of the whole scenario. Amen. That's the idea is to lock the enemy out of your life. Amen. And you do it by the word and by walking with God. Can you say amen? amen? Now, if you like the struggles and frustrations, your ride's here, then that's what, that's what happens. Okay, now, last point. God in us knows all things. So let me just give you some scripture. In 2 Peter chapter 1, 2 and 3 says, Grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. As his divine power has, past tense, given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us by glory and to virtue. Can you say amen? Now listen to this scripture, 1 John 2, verse 20 and 21 says, But you have an anointing from the Holy One, and you know all things, In your spirit knows all things. How many know your head doesn't know all things? But your spirit man does. Who lives in your spirit man? God. Does God know everything? Can you teach God in your spirit anything? No, so the word of God is to counsel your head to not get in a way with God in your spirit. So you can work tandem and in agreement with each other. Your mind and your spirit, your spirit and your mind. Say amen. amen. So you have an anointing and you know all things. And have not, I love this, and it says, I have not written to you because you do not know the truth, but because you know it and that no lies of the truth. How many know God can't lie? So he'll bear witness in your spirit, but he will not bear witness to a lie or something that's twisted. Well, you never know what God's going to do. God could be allowing this in your life to teach you a lesson. You should really automatically get, Wah! that's incorrect. Sounds good and religious, but it's incorrect. And, and, and then the enemy suggests an Old Testament scripture. Remember, we have God on the inside of us. So if God led himself through the mud and the crud, it's because there's somebody there dying you need to bring the good news to. Not 
leading you to the mud and the cruds to teach you something. Listen, trials and struggles do not teach us anything. They only frustrate. Oh, I've learned a few things. Yeah, like not to do that again. And then the second is you find yourself doing it again without God's help. Well, you will continue to repeat your flesh over and over again without God intervening. You need to ask God to come in and intervene. That's why we have him in our heart. That's why we consult him in his word. That's why we worship him and we put him first. So that God can override the lies and this flesh. By the way, you're not taking this to heaven with you. It's going to change. Amen. So why listen to it? Amen. Moving right along. Down, 1 John 2, down to verse 27, listen to this. But the anointing that you have received from him, it abides in you. And you don't need to anybody teach you anything. But as the same anointing in you teaches you concerning all things, and that is true and not a lie, just as it is taught you, you should abide in him. So the Holy Spirit's in you like a guidance system. Its job is to keep pulling you out of the world and putting you in with Christ. You blow it, pulls you out of that, puts you into Christ. He said, Lord, I'm, I don't know about this. And he says, yeah, your job, consult with Christ. Holy Spirit's job is to get you to consult with Christ. Constantly consult with Christ. Constantly talk to Christ. And if you need a little touch or two or, uh, you know, some kind of help in that area, hey, I'll help you. I had a very, very successful ministry when I first started off, but I had very, very little prayer life. And God switched that up. Because a lot of times we are running on somebody else's prayers. Grandmas, moms, dads. And it comes time now that we need to take off our diaper and walk. Can you say amen? And so we develop a good prayer life. But I'm not very good at it. Well, you got to start somewhere. Amen. If you're real thirsty and that glass of water is two chairs away from you, you've got to get up and go get it. It says a lazy man in his mind will think that he can't even lift up food to his mouth. You see, a negative person's always got a reason why they can't. And I'm going to say this to you. Maybe you like it. Maybe you won't. But God works with cans, not with can'ts. Miracles come in cans. I can do all things through Christ, not in can'ts. I just don't know. I'm this. I'm that. You know, hold on. Yes, you are. But you haven't got with God yet. Don't worry about it. Never tell the devil how you feel. Or let him know. You might feel like a hundred pounds of sin on a popsicle stick. But don't open your mouth and talk about it. Why? Periodically he listens in. Periodically he can spot the sign saying, no one home. You love that on your phone machine? They call, there's nobody home at the moment. Come and steal us blind. <laughs> Move it right along. Are you with me? How are you enjoying this? Okay, so we have an anointing, God inside of us. And every time we consult the word, we hear a song, something, somebody says something to us, God will go off. And when he goes off and bears witness... It's something have to do with your personal life and not just general. So I could be speaking the word and maybe you only got two or three sentences that really bore witness. Not that the rest of what I'm saying isn't the truth, but that truth is now personal. Maybe you got, I need to listen more and it jumped out at you and you went, oh, do it. And God says, maybe you need to fast. I only mentioned it briefly. You see, that's what the Holy Spirit's job is, is to make the general word 
personal so that you can apply it specifically and get God's desired results. Someone say amen. amen. So when you and I got born again, we received all of God in seed form. Amen. So let me read Romans 8 verses 12 through 17 to you and we'll finish. Therefore, brethren, we are not debtors to our flesh. Okay. To live according to what our flesh desires is death. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if you by the Spirit put to death, go to the altar, meet with God, the deeds and doings of your body, you will live. For as many as, now listen to this, as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. You hear what it said? Being led specifically by the Spirit of God makes you a son of God. A son of God there is the Greek word weos, spelled with an H, not with a W. It means adult supervised child. Adult supervised child. If you're led by the Spirit, the Spirit is supervising you how to apply the word. We're not a debtor to the flesh, but to the spirit. Hello? Can you say amen? Why? To walk in the spirit, we will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Galatians 5, verse 16. Now listen to the rest of this. For you did not receive the spirit of bondage for us to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption whereby we cry, Daddy, Father. And the Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit. See, there you go, that we are the children of God. Whenever you hear something that's a part of who you are in Christ, you'll have a witness go off in you. You want to look for that. Amen. Our pastor taught me, if you don't get a witness on anything that preachers preach, and get out of that and go to a place where you can. <laughs> Hello, you need the word. You're going to die on the branch if you don't get the word. Amen. I'm sorry to say that. So if then we are children, then we're heirs. Heirs of God, joint heirs with Christ. If indeed we suffer with him because we get persecuted, we'll also be glorified together. The Bible says that when he shows up, we can have boldness. Because as he is, so are we in this world. He's coming back for what kind of a bride? A spotless bride, right? Well, Pastor Kerry, even your life. I mean, gosh, you got a foot missing and you got a couple of toes missing. You're not spotless. That's not what he's talking about. He's not talking about the flesh, that you stop sinning altogether, stop making mistakes. No, he's, he's saying the one who's on the inside of you, the new born again creation, is the bride Jesus is coming back for. He's not coming back for some religious oligarch. He's coming back for a child that's like a virgin, whether male or female. Remember, in this case, we're all married to God. How many times have you heard me say, don't date Christ? Marry him. Hey, hey, we're going to go on a date in a couple of weeks. You won't see me till then. Hope that builds your love affair with me. <laughs> And that's what we, we go on about our life, and then we only meet with God when we're in trouble. Yeah. You're dating God. Don't date God. Marry him. Pledge yourself to him. Ask God to help you. Keep all your word to him. Now, you're not talking your flesh here. You're talking your spirit man. You're talking about the one who's a new creature in Christ Jesus. God, I can't go on without you. I need you, God. Are you with me? Okay. So, and finishing. Oh, thank God he's finishing. Proverbs 3, 3 through 6 says, Let not mercy or truth forsake you. Bind them around your neck. Write them on the tablets of your heart. And so you will find favor and high esteem in the sight of God and mankind. And then he goes on, Trust in the Lord with all your heart. 
and lean not to your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him. Interact with God throughout the day, and he shall direct your paths. See, God wants to order your paths. Hello? He doesn't want you stepping out. Well, I got to step out in faith. Yeah, you do step out in faith, but after you've met with God. Hello? Be anxious for nothing, but in everything through prayer and supplication. So, we have a general understanding of the word in an Old and New Testament form, but it's not until we buddy up with God that the Holy Spirit sees that we are friendly. The Holy Spirit must see that we are friendly. There's a scripture that's hidden in there that says, are you a friend of God? That's a covenant term. If you are a friend of God, you must show yourself to be friendly. Be friendly to God. There's much difference than reverencing and respecting God, which are important. But to befriend God means that God can relax around you and you can feel welcome around him and there's a bond that builds. If you got something out of that, will you give the Lord a praise? Amen.